Okay, we're recording. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Under Quarantine with Dr. Norcott. I'm so excited because we have my friend and colleague, Dr. Medallia, and she's here to talk to us about sleep. So we all know what it is. We all do it but no one really understands it. So welcome, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Share with us a little bit about what you do. I am a behavioral sleep medicine specialist at University of Chicago, and I am focused on helping patients who are suffering from insomnia. So difficulty with falling asleep or returning to sleep, and then some kind of accompanying distress or impact on functioning. And I help both adults and children. So I see adults and families, um, depending on the day. I, I feel lucky that I get to use strategies, use treatment that really helps to change people's lives and makes them feel better and gives them more energy and makes them feel more control over their lives. Yeah, absolutely. We need that feeling back, right? Yes, yes. With all of the, this uncertainty and you know, not sure about what's happening next. I think one of the one of the nice things about entering into a sleep program or working on a sleep plan is that it gives people an opportunity to feel control over something. Right. Give us a sense of you might not be able to control what's happening in the world, but you can decide when you go to bed every night. That's exactly right. Exactly. <laughs> Why do you think it's important to understand sleep? We're talking about it within the context of health and even our immune system. Why is sleep important to think about? Particularly now, I think that it's coming up a lot because of the relationship between sleep and the immune system. So we know that you know when you're sleep deprived, you're just more at risk to getting sick. It's just more important now than ever. We want people to make sure that they are getting enough sleep um, because getting enough sleep promotes inflammatory homeostasis and health maintenance. If you're chronically sleep deprived, it weakens the body's defense system and it makes you more vulnerable to contract a virus. Getting enough sleep can reduce your risk for infection. So that's oh, really interesting. Yeah, it, it's so important. And so I think some people are kind of coasting along and, you know, really busy before all this and, oh, you know, not, not prioritizing sleep because, you know, other things were taking the priority. And I'm just hoping that people can realize that now you have a time to slow down and prioritize your health, your well-being, and um, make sure that sleep is on that list because it is important. It, it protects your immune system. And, and if people are sick, if they have contracted a virus, and um, we also want them to know that sleep is also important for recovery. When the immune system is activated to fight a virus, then levels of inflammatory molecules called cytokines are associated with elevated fatigue and increased sleep needs. So getting more sleep when you are infected with a virus can help to improve your infection outcome. So it's both important from like a protective standpoint, right? Making sure you're getting enough sleep to protect you from contracting the virus. And then from an outcome standpoint, once you are, if you are unfortunately sick. Yeah, we take sleep for granted, but you know, I like what you said that it's restoring and it's where we kind of buoy our, our natural defenses against things like this virus. What are the ways in which COVID-19 has disrupted our sleep, both for people who maybe didn't have sleep problems before this or who already had like pre-existing sleep challenges? What we're seeing overall is there has been a very significant spike in sleep problems. So people are having more challenges with sleep than ever. I'm seeing lots of cases of new onset insomnia, acute insomnia, difficulty with sleep that um, in folks that have never struggled with sleep before. And we're seeing an, exacerba an exacerbation of previous sleep problems. So people who have struggled with sleep before are experiencing worsening of those symptoms um, or relapse of those symptoms. And so why is that? I mean, I think there, there are several different reasons. Number one, I think it's because of the elevated stress, anxiety, mm -hmm. uncertainty about the future. There's just so much more on the mind. And with those emotions kind of activated, um, the mind is just racing more at night. People are often like during the day, maybe trying to distract um, and not think about it so much. They don't get overwhelmed with the emotions, but 
the problems are there and the stressors are there. So when it's just you and your brain at night, then all of it kind of bubbles up to the surface and keeps people awake. Number two, we're, we're just not seeing a structure in the schedules anymore. I mean, people don't have this obligation to be at work at a certain hour or drop the kids off at school at a certain time. And so without that set anchored wake time, there is a little bit more relax in the daily schedule and people aren't getting to bed at a consistent time either and consistent bedtimes and wake times really are necessary for, for sleep optimization. And then also just people are more um, sedentary lately with, with the stay at home mandate. They're not as active and not expelling as much energy and exercise is taking new forms or limited forms. And um, with just more sedentary lifestyle, um, people are napping more and that is also resulting in more sleep problems. And then finally, electronic usage. I keep hearing from people when they look at their cell phones, their, um, their ratings and how much screen use is just exponentially spiked. So people are using screens more than ever, both for work, for socializing, and just to stay up to date with the news and you know what rules and mandates they need to follow next. And it's, people are glued to their devices more than ever now, and that's definitely taking a toll on sleep. That's so true. We are in front of screens at levels, you know, never seen before. That is so true. One of the things I noticed is that over the course of these conversations that I've been having, the R word, right? Routine. We really have had our routines disrupted. That seems to play such a role in disrupting sleep patterns. Human beings, we, we thrive on structure and predictability and routine. We need those. We need to have that sameness present um, in order to function in our best place. And it's, yeah, this time period has kind of robbed us of that structure and it's taking a toll um, both on daytime functioning and on sleep. What tips do you have from your research, from your clinical work? What can you share with people that will help them if they're having challenges with their sleep during COVID? To that point that we were just discussing, it's really important for people to set a schedule for themselves. I would recommend having a set bedtime, having a set wake time that you stick with seven days a week. I know it's really hard to do. And, you know, if you don't have to be up, it's really hard for people to get out of bed, especially when your mood's not so great and you don't really feel like getting out of the bed and just going back out to the living room and then starting another day at home. Um, but it's important and give yourself that structure because it does help. So a step bedtime week time, and then also build structure during your day to help increase the probability that that step bedtime and week time will be met. So set a meal time for breakfast, lunch, dinner, set work hours for yourself, set break times for yourself, set hobby times for yourself, um, set family times for yourself or game time for yourself. And so really like go hour by hour and set up a schedule so that you increase the probability that you'll keep a bedtime and wake time and then optimize sleep from there. Um, I would also say that, you know, your, your relationship with screens can be adjusted to optimize sleep. Um, setting boundaries on screen time is really, really important. What we do recommend is that one hour before bedtime, you turn your devices off. So on your cell phone, use the alarm feature and set a cell phone reminder that says screens off one hour before bedtime. So you're going to have your anchored wake time and bedtime. So one hour before that anchored bedtime, you're going to set a screens off cell phone reminder, have a nice relaxing pre-sleep ritual during that hour, hot bath, hot shower, soft music, light reading, and then take your cell phone, take your iPad, take your laptop, any handheld electronic device should be turned off and left charging in the kitchen. No access at all during the night. If your devices are next to you and you're at increased risk for sleep problems, then the first thing you're going to do when you're up in the middle of the night and your mind starts going is you're going to quickly grab for a distraction. And in the middle of the night, um, you're, it's harder to modulate your thoughts and emotions and make decisions that are in your best interest. 
So you're just, the temptation's too big. And with that temptation there, you're gonna lose more time for sleep if you get on those devices. And so we just don't want you to do that. Um, we want sleep hours to be used for sleep and not for electronic engagement. And then in the morning, you can wake up, walk into the kitchen and see what's there for you. That's a great time to use your electronics. That to a lot of people is gonna feel really shocking, but I can tell you, that anybody that I've ever worked with that has decreased their screen time talks about emotional benefits, sleep benefits, anxiety benefits. And so um, I really can't uh, emphasize that enough. I think that that's such great advice. And then you and I were talking in another conversation about, you know, you often hear people going, well, I need my phone for an alarm. Right. And you recommended. I recommend just get, you know, if you have an old school alarm clock sitting in your closet, pull it out and use that. Or, you know, it's interesting these days, like if you look on Amazon, on if you look at alarm clocks, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there. Um, there's some new kinds of alarm clocks. There's some that like make you solve a math puzzle before it'll stop ringing or, you know, make you, it bounces around the room or, you know, look and mm -hmm. see what's out there. You know, people are not, people need to look at alarm clocks more and invest in an alarm clock or, or just use an old school one from, you know, Walgreens or wherever. But, you know, that is not, people tell me that all the time, I need it for my alarm. You don't need it for your alarm. There are yep. alarm clocks for alarms. I know. Remember a time before cell phones. I mean, your bedroom should just be a bedroom. It should be a place that's really set up for sleep. So you don't want anything in there that is not sleep conducive, not sleep promoting. Electronic devices are not sleep conducive. They're not sleep promoting. So leave them out, right? Either is mm -hmm. work. Leave everything work related out of the bedroom, right? It should just be your bed, your dresser, and your closet. And that's it. White noise machine, eye mask, mm. and keep it nice and cool in there. And, and, you know, call it a day. Let's simplify our life by having a bedroom that's more conducive for sleep. And I know for some people out there, they are sharing space. So they're really living in their bedroom. But I think there are even ways to make a small room different in different parts of the room. So you can have a corner, that's your corner for studying. Where your bed is, is your sleep area. And you can do things that can cue yourself when you're in that part of your room, that that's the sleep part. So don't feel like these tips can't uh, relate to you if you're in a non-traditional or a smaller, more cramped sleeping and living environment. You can, there's still small tweaks you can make uh, to take Lisa's advice. Absolutely. That's a great, great point. Put some, you know, curtains or room dividers up, um, but making sure that you separate your home in a way that separates your sleep location is a great move. I want to cue people to where they can find more of your helpful tips because we only have a short amount of time here, but you have developed a place where people can go and uh, in the, you know, conveniently access all of the work and you've compiled it in one place. Can you tell us a little bit about that place? Sure, absolutely. So yeah, that place is called Dr. Lullaby, D-R-L-U-L-L-A-B-Y. And it's an iOS app that allows people to access the same strategies that I would deliver if I saw them in clinic. So they can fill in sleep logs and get a customized set of behavior change strategies and learn what to do to optimize sleep. So it's, you know, it's visually kind of set up for helping with children and families, but also can very readily help with adult sleep issues and sleep optimization for adults. And really, it's a great place so that for folks to learn the tips and tools for improving sleep. And this is my dog. She's... <laughs> Yay, I was going to ask you to give her a little shout out. Yeah, she's so cute. What's nice about Dr. Lullaby is that you can access it from home. So if you're listening to this and you are inspired and want to work on sleep and you feel like this is a time when you can really dedicate yourself to a sleep plan, then you can access these tools from home. Just download the app. We wanted to make sure that it was available during the pandemic because we know that sleep problems have spiked so much. So we wanted to get it out there for you guys. 
can't wait to check it out. I know that any sleep tips are welcome, at least in my life and my schedule. So just thank you for all the work that you've done in the area and sharing your time today so that we can get the information out to more people. Thank you, Candace. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care until next time.